Today, we're joined by inspiring Katie, the voice behind kids' mental wellness. Katie is a mom, outdoor enthusiast, and psychiatric PA, with a passion for educating families on natural and lifestyle-based approaches to children's mental health. From her small farm in Virginia, Katie shares her journey for balancing family life, advocating for her children, and helping others find natural ways to support mental wellness. So Katie, welcome you here. We're so happy to have you join our podcast today. Thank you, Natasha. I'm so happy to be here to talk about kids' mental wellness community. We love our Brain Rich Climbers, so we are excited to chat with you today. Thank you so much. Start by introducing, probably, if you can share your journey a little bit. I know you use, you also serve in the military, right? So you have very interesting background, and you also work part-time as a, P, as a psychiatric PA, and you're sharing on your channel, you're sharing the journey, kind of working in the clinic with your patients and also mm -hmm. kind of translating that natural lifestyle into your family. Can you share yeah. about this? I would love to share. It's been an interesting journey to get here. I was in the military. I was a PA in the military for almost eight years. And so from there, I did all sorts of medicine. I did sports medicine, family medicine, urgent care type clinic work. And I got out because I had two kids under the age of two. So back-to-back -back babies, and my husband was active duty, and we were tired. <laughs> two under two is a whole experience. And we just felt burned out. So I decided to get out and be a stay-at-home mom. My kids are now seven and eight. I was a stay-at-home mom for four years. And then I went back to clinic. But I was very specific when I went back to clinic. I wanted to work part-time. I started working in a psych psychiatry clinic. And I've been there for over a year, and I love what I do. But it also coincided with my daughter's journey with mental health. And those two things led me to a place. I saw a need for parents, and I wanted to create a space that we could educate on natural choices. Because I don't think there's a lot of that out there right now. I found that, as you said, a lot of parents, especially if they have multiple kids, right? It's the idea of balancing out your life. Obviously, you want to raise a healthy child, right? well-rounded child. But then if you're facing some other challenges, you have to dig in and start researching and what's good. And it's just overwhelming. And especially if you need to work full time, you have to balance it. It's a lot. That's why I was so happy when we yeah. found your channel. It's like this. Makes me so happy. Yeah. It is. And this is the one thing I'll say. I'm a psychiatric PA. My child was struggling and I felt lost in a system. And I felt like I was being pushed to not answer any of the causes that was going on. Everybody said, oh, here's your medication and that's it. And no matter how hard I pushed, nobody was digging deeper with me. And I was so frustrated. We ended up leaving a pediatrician's office in tears. I ended up calling and making formal complaints. And I said, I know there's something going on. And I want to make sure that I treat the whole patient, that I look at all the causes and I wanted the same for my child, and it was really hard to get that. And I thought, my gosh, if I'm a provider in this system, and I'm talking to a fellow provider, this should be simple for me. And with it not being simple, I realized that's probably the experience for so many parents, and that's so unfair. I do try to bring my clinical experience, as well as our personal journey, into this community on Instagram and say, okay, here's what happened to us. And here's what it looks like when patients come to me. And this is what I advocate for both in my personal life and in my clinic. Yeah, we can maybe go a little bit more into specific because I find sometimes when you mention something more specific, it will help that person that might listen and they go through the same thing. So Katie, can you tell us more about what motivated you to focus on natural and lifestyle-based approaches to children's mental health? Yeah, we live on a farm. My kids are raised outside. They go to a forest school part-time. We eat organic. We are what I would call a kind of crunchy family. And I want holistic health care. I want to look at the whole person. And my daughter was struggling majorly with big emotional meltdowns, just being dysregulated, not able to sleep. And for us, it was really hard. I thought we were doing all the right things. We were doing the gentle parenting, the connection, but we were missing something. And we went to healthcare providers and were kind of brushed off, essentially. And how old was she at the time? She was six at the time that we really started struggling. 
Um, and so to be kind of brushed off that way and just say, here's the medicine. I said, no, I want holistic. I want you to look at her. I want labs done. I want an evaluation. I want, I want someone to listen to me and, you know, being a provider and talking to another provider, it should have been simple. And to feel like I was brushed off, I knew other parents were going through that and getting brushed off and just taking the meds and trusting someone because that was their only choice. So I wanted to create a space where we could talk about treating the whole child. You know, we could talk about kind of those holistic practices and build a toolbox, not just here's a medication, because I don't think medication is bad, but I think it's a tool. And what other tools are there? There's so many. There's so many when we look at it. And so that's why I decided to create this kind of community for parents. Katie, can you name, I don't know, maybe three things that you found that were causing some of those meltdowns with your own child? Girls, it's a little bit too loud. So <laughs> they're taking the tape. Okay. Doing your own research, a few things that you found that may have been a cause for your child's meltdowns. So the first thing we did was dietary changes. And I'm not a huge fan of jumping into elimination diets kind of willy-nilly. That's hard on parents and kids alike. But the the one thing that I tell everybody is we eliminated dyes from our diet. Artificial dyes, they're not meant to be in our food. They're known chemicals and toxins. And I think we have enough evidence out there to say these aren't good for us or our kids. And when we did that, we noticed a huge change. And now if she has something with red dye in it, she can say that makes my brain feel crazy. So I think... Mm -hmm. And I hear that a lot from parents that once you eliminate it and if they have it in small amounts, right? Because if we're at a birthday party or somewhere, she's going to have it. But she can say, I don't like that. So dietary changes, we switched to organic. Now we did eventually move to a gluten-free diet. But I think those small changes of reducing chemicals and toxins in the food, it can be such a big shift for kids. The other thing was prioritized movement. There, I think there's a lot of like parenting that says calm down, sit down, and you can regulate that way. And that may work for some children, but most kids, especially neurodivergent kids, movement helps regulate. And as we were embracing this ADHD diagnosis in our daughter, we had to learn to encourage movement during moments of dysregulation. And so for us, moving your body. So during these big meltdowns, it's easy to say, let's calm down, let's sit still. And that is so hard for those kids. So let's jump in the sensory swing. Let's jump on our brain-rich climber. Let's move our body in a purposeful way. And when we learn to help her do that, it's such a difference in those meltdowns. Let me ask you this thing. How does the, if you can maybe share maybe your exact strategy. So for example, a child goes into, so I've noticed with my younger one, right? When she's tired, it's a flip of a switch and she goes into this like meltdown mode. And when I tried to reason with her, right, it was like, it's okay. There's nothing. There's no connection. No connection. I tried to like give her space. For now, this is my way to just to kind of have her, like letting her to train herself to get off of those feelings when she's, when she's so stressed. I know she cannot resonate with me at those moments, right? But to me, okay, I just need to give her space, just mm -hmm. be next to her. She tends to like hit the walls, you know, yeah. like bouncing around. This is what she does since we have neighbors. You just like not bump <laughs> the floor and stuff like that. But I know she needs that. And I know that's her way out. It was like yeah. just so much. It was like a battery, right? You just like exploding. I know this is why she's doing that. But to me, it's like we have a climber too, but. I cannot reason with her to go on the climber on those moments. Maybe she's still too young or something. If you can share your strategy, how, how do you manage in, in the moments when it's just a blank stare? How do you have them? It's, it's so hard. And I think that's the hard part is they're not regulated. They are, there's no logic. There's no reasoning. It's not. It's a very emotional response. What's worked for us is we talk about it ahead of time. When you feel that way, and we call them firecracker moments, when you feel the firecrackers coming, what can we do? And you have two choices. You can go on the climber, you can go outside, or you can go in your sensory swing, and that's it. And so when those firecrackers happen, we say, which choice do you want? And then we can generally guide that choice. And then we're still with her. And so she doesn't, doesn't really want us to talk things out, but we found when the big moments happen, we kind of have what we call our little mantra, you are safe, 
You are loved. It's going to be okay. And we can just say those things because really in those moments, the reassurance she's looking for, at least in our family, is she wants to know that no matter what naughty behavior, what meltdowns or firecrackers happen, she wants to feel loved and that that's not going to go away. And I think that's a big component of neurodivergent kids is any correction can be so personal. And it's like you say, gosh, you know, do this. And I'm a bad kid. I'm the worst kid in the world. I'm like, oh my gosh, I never said that. I said you didn't vacuum the floor or something, but something very benign. Yeah, this is my worst fear as a parent. Yeah. So the reassurance of just you're safe, you're loved, uh, nothing you can do right now is going to make me not love you. But talking ahead of time, I think, and like setting those expectations is really helpful. And a book, if you follow on my stuff, I always talk about this book called The Explosive Child. You can grab it on Amazon for a few bucks, but it it talks about the theory that kids will do well when they can. And the only reason they're really not doing well in those moments or not listening or not working with you is because they don't have the skill set to do so. And that's just it. And when we reframe our thinking as parents that they don't have the skill set to emotionally regulate to meet us in that moment, that's all it is. And so how do we help them develop that skill set? And I think that's what you're asking. And it's so perfect. It's like, okay, ahead of time, we're going to make a plan. And we're going to execute that plan every single time. I'm, I'm going to be consistent no matter what you do. And that's huge for them. That makes sense because as an adult, you, you have way more capacity to, to understand the situation and to guide them versus their immature brain where they, they just go to like fear, like flight. Yeah. No, how do they call? What's that stage? Is a the fight or flight? Fight or flight stage. Yeah. When, it's yeah, their their brain is just shutting off. For an experienced parent, I would say those moments could be tough, right? What is going on? I was like, she needs to do that or he needs to do this. And I told you, you're getting mad from not being able to control the situation, yeah. control your child the way you wanted to. But then you just have to look at them. You have to look from the angle that a child at the moment, like this child's brain, is immature to even control itself. So instead of you trying to shut off that behavior, you have to understand how you can help it in the future, right? Okay, this is happening right now. You just have to let it go. Just kind of have to uh, let the child adjust, right? And calm yourself too, because some parents, they they It's they so get it. triggering for a lot of parents. Right. And yeah. then you escalate and they escalate and gosh, it just yeah, becomes it, this big thing. Yeah. As you were saying, trying to find in a calm situation, right? This is what I'm learning from you too. Like in a calm situation to kind of come up with a plan. What do you do? What are you going to do in case this is happens again? And it will happen. And I, I mean, it's kids, right? It will happen again and again. <laughs> right. And the more consistent you are in your approach, I mean, that's the thing. And what I can tell, right, if I'm not consistent and I'm not calm and I don't present it the same way, we don't always have the easiest outcome. You know, it ends up escalating further. And I have to step back and say, okay, what is my role here? My role is to do this, this, and this. I calm down. I offer the solutions and I go back to our mantra. And then life is okay again. And that's our role as parents. And I think, you know, our parents, our job really is to just have a toolkit for our kids and every time present the same tools. And that's what I'm so passionate about is creating the toolbox for parents of what are the things that you can offer in those moments. So what role do you believe outdoor activities and natural environments play in promoting mental wellness in children? This is my true passion. I think nature is the best medicine. It is therapy. It is the place where children belong. And it is a part that kind of breaks my heart. When I look at the statistics, kids, this average American child gets less than 10 minutes a day outside. There's a mental health crisis with one in six kids getting a diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis. And when you look at those two facts combined and you look at the statistics over the past, you know, say 50 years, you can't convince me that it's not correlated. Again, this is one that we have enough science. We have enough education and evidence to say that time spent outside, you know, it helps a child develop both their motor and strength and coordination. So physically, it helps them. We've also proven that it reduces their stress. It helps their cognitive improvement. It helps their, you know, verbal and physical and mental capacities. So 
there's enough evidence to show that being outside helps a child, both mind and body. And the fact that they're not getting it, I think, is a huge part of the problem. We had another podcast with them. I forgot exactly. But yeah, it's the same thing. It's kind of like we hear this, the same, same way of thought over and over, over and over. And it's, it's really interesting because if you look at the, at the statistics, if you look what happens in school, right? Some people, some teachers, they tend to eliminate the recess time as a punishment, right? For bad <laughs> behavior or something like that, which doesn't make sense. And, and to, to me, it's kind of, in the day and age that we live right now, with so many resources, with so many studies done on the movement and, and all of that, it seems like that the education, public school education, it kind of stays behind. For some reason, it doesn't really take, it, it, for some reason, brain development at, at early ages, to me, they don't take that into consideration, right? So they, they work on the school program without considering the movement part it's yeah so when i look at the united states public education system i obviously th there's some flaws in it but some of it can be good you know we choose to homeschool and forest school so we do things a little bit different and but i think it's interesting i look at other countries or even when we were homeschooling in north carolina education formal education was not required as a homeschooler until past age seven and I think this is where we're missing the mark. We need to incorporate movement and play and nothing else up until age seven. And there's going to be a lot of people that go, oh, they need to be reading or writing. And they don't. They don't. If a child's motivated and wants to, certainly that's amazing. But if they don't, that's okay too. But we're missing a key component in child development when we push early education. And I think movement or play are critical. And I think they're critical even past age seven. And we're seeing a lot of, you know, public school, but also extracurriculars, tutoring, all the, this world where these children are living like these little mini grown up lives instead of going outside and playing. And, you know, I hear it a lot. Well, my kids don't like to go outside and play. And I say, that's OK. Go do it with them. Find ways. You know, and I try to offer some creative solutions. But getting your kids outside and letting them be bored is the best thing we can absolutely do for our kids. Let them get muddy. Don't worry about their shoes. Go send them outside and just watch the magic happen. And this is something we do a lot is we get our kids outside every morning. We try to do every morning at least 10 minutes outside before we start our day. That means before you brush your teeth, before you get dressed, go outside for 10 minutes. It's also what adults should be doing. You know, when I talk to everybody who's depressed and anxious and because they're not going outside, but the morning light natural sunlight, being outside with the sounds of nature, it's so good for our mental health. I think we need to incorporate all those things. I'm wondering now, with all the knowledge that you're accumulating about the natural ways, support, I mean, all, uh, how nature intended for you to, to be a certain way, you know, when you go to a clinic, does it help you or does it actually kind of, in a good sense, on your way to, to to have a traditional way of helping of helping your patients? I don't, does it make sense the way I'm asking? It's like your knowledge. It's, yeah. It's sometimes, it feels sometimes like a battle, right? In clinic, because I do traditional medicine. I'm not a functional medicine provider. I offer prescription medication and that is my role. I evaluate, diagnose, and use medication management. But I also educate. And so I love the company I work for because they allow me time with my patients. I don't feel rushed. If I need extra time, I have it generally. And I get to educate them. I get to educate them on the labs that I want done with their primary care. I get to educate them on time outside. I get to educate them on, you know, certain supplements and vitamins that they need to be taking. I get to offer them the advice on getting outside 10 minutes in the morning. And so I love that I get to marry those two ideas together. I do. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think your clinic is super happy to have you. <laughs> well, and so it's this thing, you know, I saw it and it's kind of the say, let's say the crunchy group on Instagram, right? Of what if more providers offered nature and sunlight as a, as a therapy instead of medications? And I think I even made content on this. I said, well, but what if more parents listened? What if more parents listened to me when I said, take your kids outside for 10 minutes in the morning? I understand it's not everybody's lifestyle and it's not everybody's desire to be outside, but 
what if more people tried it, you know? And I think that sometimes is the harder part of it for me is when people say, no, thanks. I'd rather just take my medicine. But then they come back and they say their medicine's not working. And I'm like, I know. Because we need to treat it as a whole picture. And if we're not taking care of our bodies. Girl. And, and then they, I heard them come inside. So my guess is they've gone upstairs. And <laughs> they're probably watching the show right now. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I wish more providers were like you. Because I'm the same way. I, I don't really go often to pediatricians anymore. Because it, it just feels very, I don't know. Not not personal. Mine are a little bit older, and mine have also, like I said, I think they went right upstairs and went turned on that TV so they could get their hour of TV in today. And no, but what I was was what I was trying to to tell, I'm trying to like as a parent that goes through my mind when you go to a clinic, you rely. I mean, you trust the pediatrician, you trust the doctors that you see, right? But if the system or if a doctor doesn't want anything but prescribe the medicine or just go by the by the book that he studies in medical school you know to me it's just it's super hard and kind of frustrating because i'm going for you as an authority like your role i trust you but then can i trust you you know <laughs> and it's it's so hard. And I would like to say yes, but sometimes the answer is no, right? I tell you, I fired my pediatrician. I filed formal complaints. But, and there's this new, you know, functional medicine, which I would love for everyone to go see a functional provider, but that's expensive. Most do not take insurance. Most of my patients that I see in clinic are Medicaid, Medicare type patients. So they don't have the extra money to go spend to go see this. So I think it's important that traditional providers start offering and kind of including these holistic practices. And I educate all my, you know, my parents and the, everybody on my community. I say, listen, I'm not a healthcare provider on Instagram. I can't tell you what to do. What I will tell you is if you came into my clinic, I would want to see these labs done. I also believe in supplements. And I think supplements, good quality supplements, which is why I educate on what to look for in a good quality supplement, can be so beneficial, right? Again, they're one of the tools in the toolbox that we're building. And you'll hear a lot of doctors just write off supplements and say, pish posh, we're not going to take that. Don't, don't take supplements. But they, they don't know what's in the supplement, but they don't have the education behind them. And so they, a lot of them will say no. And I find that hard too. And I find it hard when they don't want to do a, an evaluation. Do the, do, the, do the work, right? Look for other reasons before we medicate. And I think that's really important to me because I do medication management. And medications can be great, but they also can have side effects. And so for my child living in this kind of organic, crunchy world, I knew medication was an answer maybe down the road, but I knew we weren't there yet. And I think that's where a lot of parents feel caught. Well, maybe they need medicine, but not, not yet because we haven't gotten there. And she's not on medicine. So I feel really good with everything that we've provided my daughter. But I want to make sure everybody kind of sees that path of medicines might be in my future, but how do I, what else can I do? Yeah, that that's true. So, Katie, can we build a little a toolbox for our listeners today? What yes. can they do to help out to lead that natural lifestyle with their family and their kids? Yes, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. I love this question. My toolkit is always dietary changes. So work on your diet. Clean whole foods. There's so much processed stuff out there. Now we eat some processed foods, so do my kids, but in moderation should be actual foods in your in your diet. Removing dye is such an easy first step. I mean, it's not easy, it's in everything. Um, but it's a it's a simple first step to take. The other thing is sunlight. Get outside. It doesn't have to be beautiful weather. Get the right gear. Go thrift shopping, you know, find boots or coats or whatever. We buy everything secondhand, but my kids are outside and then it's secondhand clothes so it's okay if it's muddy and dirty and whatever. Find ways to get outside. Print off a scavenger hunt. Do something fun together. If you're looking at supplements, look for supplements that are clean, that are sourced properly, that are tested by third-party testing for things like chemicals and toxins and heavy metals. Make sure that they're quality and backed. You know, most things off the drugstore counter are probably not going to be what you're looking for. And then read some books that apply to your family. So if you have a kid with meltdowns, read The Explosive Child. 
read, you know, the barefoot kids book, you know, follow along on social media to like that thousand hours outside, right? Get motivated and find your community somewhere. And I think that piece is so important to educate and find your community because it you can't do it alone, right? It's exhausting and it's hard. And we shouldn't be have we shouldn't have to do it alone. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Those those are all really helpful. And it's kind of interesting. You mentioned the over the counter supplements. I do find there's a actually the dice in those over the counter supplements, right? You think you're buying something good, but then you have to kind of realize that they're artificial dyes and some sweeteners and stuff like that. So yes. is it really good? Yes. And so it is hard. I feel like every pediatrician says, just take melatonin to help you sleep. And I'm like, oh, no, everyone stop. Like, I really don't think that's the right answer. And, you know, I do some education on that and why we shouldn't be just grabbing melatonin, a synthetic hormone off the counters of, you know, Walgreens, wherever. It's like, hold on, let's pump the brakes and let's look at what we're doing and let's look at why we're not sleeping. And that was something, I mean, gosh, and I never want to ever judge anyone, right? I used over-the-counter melatonin for my daughter for a while. I was desperate. I was tired. I hadn't slept in six years through the night. And then we finally got a provider that listened and did the lab work that I would suggest. And she needed an iron infusion. We sat in a chair. She got an iron infusion for five hours. And within days, she was a different child. I cannot tell you, right? But it took me two years to get someone to listen. Wow. Someone to and, listen. And, and you figure out those t- lab tests just from your own research? From my own research and then just learning and then talking to her providers that have listened and then being in the psychiatry world now and learning more and more about some of the root causes of mental health issues. And I think, you know, when I look at it, it's so simple, some of these things. And, you know, like I say, we live this very clean lifestyle and to see my daughter's, you know, iron levels, this kid eats like broccoli and salmon every day if she could to see her vitamin D be bottomed out. She lives outside practically. I always joke my kid's feral. I don't know how her vitamin D is low, but it's because she had some gut issues. And so once we restored her gut health, we were able to kind of move past that and she was able to absorb the nutrients she was eating and she changed. And that to me is so powerful. Because had we not dug deeper, we would have just ended up medicating and moving on with our life. And I think that would have been such a disservice to her. And if I, my my guess is like if she already had some gut issues, as soon as you start medication, that's not going to help, right? The, the, the artificial medicine, it will just make it worse. And yeah. then you just go to a stronger medication because that one doesn't work. It's such a vicious cycle. And, you know, I see it so often. So I think it's important that we talk about kind of stopping, pausing, digging a little deeper. And when medication's needed, take the time with medication and really educate and and choose the right medication and and have an honest conversation with your provider of what that's going to look like and what side effects there are. And importantly, how to mitigate those side effects. There's things we can do to still support the body while we're on medication. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think all that's important to talk about too. Yeah, there is a time where you absolutely need to take medication. But then, as you said, you just have to kind of understand what what are you taking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you touch a little bit? So with your daughter, you didn't want to do the medication route at first, right? You were trying to find the natural ways. How did you understood that there is something with her gut that you need to address? It took us a long time to understand that. And I didn't really fully understand the gut connection until we started seeing her lab work coming back low and knowing, you know, they say, okay, we'll change your diet. I go, this kid, it's the healthiest diet. And really she's outside all the time. And so what can I, what else, you know, and then so by finding some inflammatory markers, some other things and starting to see that really she wasn't absorbing what she was eating. You know, she wasn't gaining weight. She had the dark circles under her eyes. I mean, she kind of was just not thriving. And so once we found that, and then we found it's like some supplements, but also through dietary changes. And that's when we went gluten-free to kind of avoid some inflammatory things. And we were able to adjust that. It was just such a profound difference in her. She still has ADHD, right? She still does. She still has some explosive moments. She still has meltdowns. And we're reading and learning to parent that. But the difference in her is huge, right? She is healthy. She's able to regulate. She's able to handle transitions and stress. 
And she's able to like kind of have that pause moment before the firecrackers happen. Mm-hmm. It's much fewer and far between now that it's it's just it's been such a good change. Yeah. I cannot even describe in the course of two years how far we've come. Awesome. Well, and I'm kind of talking from from maybe from your audience as well that's watching. I'm sure people are grateful that you're sharing your story on on your channels because that might help to someone else as well. Which is I good. hope so. I hope so. That's tell the people goal. tell people how they can find you and some of the resources that you provide that they can look into. Yes, please follow along. I'm at Kids Mental Wellness on Instagram. I have an email that goes out every month. It's a one-page email, so you can sign up right at the link in my bio. Um, usually just educational tips, advice, any sales or deals on some of the products that we are, that I talk about through the month, and then a monthly recap of you know quotes, books that I've recommended, or if we've had an in-depth conversation about a specific topic. So this week, uh, my viewers have asked me to go into depth on depression, so I'm going to talk about childhood depression, and then I'll add those things to the newsletter. That's how you can find me. And I hope you guys follow along uh, and I'm excited and I appreciate you having me here today, Natasha. Thank you. And then probably if we can summarize. So with the winter season coming, right? As much as people want to take their kids outdoor, what they can do indoor to balance out those days where it's cold, when it's rainy, when something is, I mean, when parents cannot take them out, what are the things maybe you do with your family that help you to balance that out? There is no day that we can't go outside. I am out there in the rain puddles, splashing with my kids, having fun. And I encourage parents to like embrace that inner child and get out and get messy inside with their kids. You know, we have winters here. We have animals. We're outside every day regardless because we have a farm. But some parents, right, that's not their jam. I get it. But incorporate the day in some way, even if it's 10 minutes, go for a drive outside, go for a short walk just to the mailbox and back, make it a game you know, and incorporate movement inside the home. So set up a floor as lava game, you know, not just the the calm reading and and board games, but incorporate movement inside of your home. The climber is a perfect thing. A sensory swing is the perfect thing. And let your body, let your child's body really move because I think that is key to staying regulated and really their overall mental health. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So, yeah, I guess to summarize the, the whole episode, we can say that if you can look at the dietary changes for yourself, for your whole family, because kids will look at what you eat, right? And they, they soak up everything like a sponges and then they will translate into them. Then go outside, move. <laughs> if, you cannot get, if you cannot go outside, move inside, uh, but make sure you move. <laughs> Every day. Every day. And the third, you just have to really watch if there is a if there is a a a need to take medicines or you just have to do it, just watch what you take in. Whatever goes in goes out, right? So you have to you have to treat your body as as an overall system, not just a one one thing to fix specific problem. You have to see where it leads to in the long run. That's that's how I see it. Right. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. It, it's been really um, insightful too. And I'm, I would like people to follow you as well, because I think what you share on your Instagram is, is just, it's so pure. It's nice to see family kind of set up where you all, all for a healthy lifestyle. I'm the same way. I, I'm not perfect 100%. Nobody is. Nobody I, is. I'm the same way. I watch what I eat. I'm really cautious what my kids grab on the go as well, because that's that's another thing when you when you're outside and there's so many temptations to to grab something that is not healthy right yeah so we do that and we do try to move a lot <laughs> my one thing that i would love to do it maybe you can help out i'm just going to guide them to direction so if i would like to have my kids kids like test out their gut for example to see if whatever like i don't know if it's like allergy tests or something how do i know that the food that they eat is beneficial for them like 100%. Yeah, so you can do this. There's such a level here of what you can start testing. You can just go through basic labs with your pediatrician. So like, you know, their cell count with, you know, thyroid, say B vitamin, vitamin D, iron, like a full iron panel, which is important. You can kind of start there. 
And then you can go, depending on how far and how much you want to spend, again, because not a lot of it's covered. You can get into functional medicine. They have different gut protocols. They have different inflammatory markers. They have the MTHFR gene mutation to see if they're methylators or not, or methylation or not. That's not said properly. but you And you can go through kind of how deep you want to dive into it. And so I think that just is, it's it's so variable and also so costly as you go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. So we kind of yeah. stopped partially down the rabbit hole because we started seeing such positive changes with everything we were doing. And I've still questioned doing some of the further gut testing or further testing, but insurance doesn't cover it and that's expensive. And sometimes it's worth it. And sometimes you say, okay, what we're doing is working. So I know we're making progress. So those are kind of the options to start with. But it, the extensive, extensive stuff is going to be with a functional medicine provider. Got it. Katie, thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge and your personal journey with us today. Your dedication and empowering parents with natural options for their children's mental wealth is truly admirable. We're grateful for the insights you provided and we look forward to seeing the continued impact of work you do. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Natasha. 